Good morning. And a very warm welcome to worship this morning if you're here in person or online or on the phone line. And we thank you for wearing your face masks and sitting where you're told to sit and doing all the things that we need to do to keep everybody safe. Uh, don't forget that you do need to book each week to, to keep going, uh, to coming to church. For those online or on the phone line, we're aware that the sound has been variable. We are working on it and we're hoping we're getting it sussed, but please bear with us. Our intimations this week are for Instant Neighbour for the food bank. Um, there's, they're short of things, and you'll have seen Susan's car out there that uh, is taking donations today. And if you forgot to bring them today, I'm sure Susan will collect them from you if you let her know. But they are short of quite a few things at the moment. And we can't yet gather here for tea and coffee, but we are asking that uh, if you are on Zoom and you'd like to chat with us, Come and join us on Zoom for coffee after church. Um, it's not quite the same as gathering around a table here, but at least it's some way to catch up with people. We, we try and open it for half past 11, but that depends what time we finish here. <laughs> Sometimes I don't quite get home for half past 11. But if I'm not there, we will be soon. Right, that's all our intimations today, so let's just take a moment to breathe, relax, and prepare ourselves to worship. Our call to worship today is based on the words of Bridget of Gale. We arise today through a mighty strength, God's power to guide us, God's might to uphold us, God's eyes to watch over us, God's ear to hear us, God's word to give us speech, God's hand to guard us, God's way to lie before us, God's shield to shelter us. So shake off the dust of tiredness, come and be refreshed. Shake off the dust of complacency, come and be challenged. Shake off the dust of hesitancy. Come and be encouraged to be Christ's hands and Christ's feet in our world today. We're going to sing our first hymn. We remain seated with our masks on, but we're going to sing hymn number 465, Be Thou My Vision.
Gracious God, we gather in the name of your Son to hear words of Scripture, to pray for our world, to sing praises, and to be silent and still. We gather as your people, whose mission is to share your love, grace, and healing. Forgive us, Lord, when we do not travel light, when we are weighed down by our fear of failure, with wanting to be approved, with needing to do things the way we've always done them. Forgive us and free us to voice your wisdom, embody your compassion, and share your healing. We lay aside all the times that we have felt rejected to receive the gifts of acceptance and a new beginning from you. For you are the one who affirms and commissions us, the one who calls us by name today. We gather and give thanks for your presence with us. And this we pray in Jesus' name. And in his name, I invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our reading today will be read for us by Alison MacLeod. Our reading today is from Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 13 the rejection of Jesus at Nazareth. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, Where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offence at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honour except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them, and he was amazed at their unbelief. The Mission of the Twelve. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Thanks be to God for this reading from his holy word. Amen.
Many preachers can remember the first time they preached in front of their parents. It's not really the same as things that other people do. If you're a musician, your parents probably heard you practicing when you were younger or probably even bullied you into doing it. Come on, come on, practice. If you were a footballer, they'll have seen those skills in the garden. But preaching is something dangerously public that emerges from something intensely private. Parents and others who've known you when you were growing up maybe even uncles and aunts and grandparents, are inclined to be embarrassed, both at revelations of things that are personal and at it being waved around in front of the neighbours, because preaching is personal. There are elements of yourself that you show. And the family is sort of saying, don't tell the neighbours, don't let on, don't let on that we have problems too. We can't let people know that. And they also have this problem that you're still a little girl. You know, how can you stand up and do this? And Jesus was in his hometown and they're going, who does he think he is? And he wasn't just another preacher. He, wasn't, he was saying this on his own authority, that the kingdom was coming and doing things to demonstrate it. And this was not the sort of kingdom his neighbours wanted to hear about. So they dismissed it, with the equivalent of, what would he know? He's the local handyman. Jesus wasn't what they expected in a prophet, let alone a messiah. And to, ac to accept him as such was to call into question much of what they thought they knew about the world, about people, and about themselves. Extraordinary people can make us feel threatened and perhaps it's also that we have a bit of a hard time receiving grace from unexpected places. In this case, it's not that Jesus was different from them. He was one of them. It's that he's different from what they think a prophet should be. And so rather than revise their expectations, they just dismiss him. So what does Jesus do in response? First, he cures a few people, and then he seems almost unable to do any great work of power because they have no real interest in receiving what he's offering. So he commissions his disciples to go out. And as we move between these two different parts of the story, there is between them a fascinating movement or even a transformation in the relationship between Jesus and his disciples. By the end of these scenes, the disciples are no longer just observers watching Jesus do miracles. They are no longer just followers. Discipleship, it turns out, is not just about learning from and following another, it's also taking on the role and authority of the one that you follow. And this mission to announce the kingdom and share God's love will take more than one, just one miracle worker. It will take a team of people, empowered, equipped, and sent to witness to God's grace, justice, and mercy. And the disciples are sent out to live utterly dependent on the grace and hospitality of others. They're not to take everything they need, but invite others into their mission and their lives. Which is particularly interesting because while Jesus has just been on the receiving end of an extreme lack of hospitality from his hometown, he still knows that the human community he is forming has at its core the interdependence, mutuality, and utter vulnerability that true hospitality simultaneously demands and creates. A few years ago, amidst some publicity, a man set out with nothing to travel from Britain to India, intending to demonstrate that people are naturally hospitable. Sometime later, conceding failure, he returned home, 
to learn French. He had determined that the one thing which he needed, which he did not have, was a basic capacity for communication, a vital tool in the building of community. And that reminded me of an anecdote I, I heard on QI, and I think it was Alan Davies that talked about it. And he talked about how he'd been listening to a podcast or a program, and they had said that the foundation of civilization was luggage. Oh, wouldn't have thought that, but I suppose people have started moving around, and maybe they need stuff to carry, to, they'd be able to carry their stuff around with them, and so, yeah. Maybe luggage was the foundation of civilization. And then as they carried on talking, he realized he'd misheard it. The foundation of civilization was language. <laughs> Communication and interaction are key, but we can only do that when we understand each other. Our world, our community is different to the one the disciples were in. That man did his journey as an experiment. The disciples were setting out with a mission and a purpose. And Jesus was not just choosing to delegate to give his followers experience and get the work done more quickly, although maybe that was part of it as well. But it was a symbolic act of witness as to the urgency of God's timetable. Off go the 12, symbolic of God's renewed people, driving out evil, awakening mem memories of the prophecies of the sick being healed, but more importantly, preparing the ground for the very different work that would take place in the aftermath of the great crisis. If we are to understand this passage in our own context, it will not do to suppose that we have to copy exactly Jesus' instructions to his followers which were for a specific time and place and purpose. But neither can we set them aside as irrelevant. The church and the world continue to face crises. And part of being a disciple is to have the spiritual sensitivity and discernment to know what steps to take. But the steps we may take are easier to take when we know we do not walk this path alone. So we turn for help and courage to Jesus, the one who still sends disciples out, equipped with the power to face down the unclean spirits of prejudice and discrimination in whatever form they appear. And we turn to each other as well. In the last year and a half, we've relied significantly on our online broadcasts of services and messages to stay in touch with the congregation and those near and far away. And that's had a lot of advantages. Some people who can't physically get to church have been able to join in. When none of us could come to church, we had an option to get together with people. People watching services from their local church but also from around the world. I know we've had somebody from Canada watching regularly and probably from other parts of the world too. People who've been shielding can still participate in a familiar setting and feel some of their familiar church. People can watch at a time that suits them, whether that's six o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock at night, it's there for them. And from the comfort of their own homes sitting on the sofa, not having to go out if it's cold and wet, not having to think about what to wear. And some people find online worship more nourishing for a variety of reasons. And can you believe it? Some people even fast forward over the bits they don't want to watch. You don't get that option if you're sitting here. <laughs> These are all advantages of online worship. And for some people, because of distance and illness, physical limitations or other reasons, online is still the best way for them to join us in worship. But there are elements of our discipleship that we experience in church that I think we can't experience fully in church on the sofa. Because Christians are not consumers, we are contributors. We don't just watch, we engage, we give, 
we sacrifice, we encourage, we seek to serve. We are disciples. We are a community of faith worshipping together. And while that can be done from our sofas, I think there's something much more powerful about being able to be part of something in the same building and see each other physically. Hear each other sing, albeit with masks on just now, engage together at the same time. Come alongside one another physically, not just through a screen. I've been so grateful for a chance to worship online and reach out further and stay connected with people. But I have to admit, I've also been glad to see people in person, even at a distance. There's something about seeing people in, per uh, people in person that cannot be recreated through a screen. And while I'm very grateful for technology that keeps people connected, that can't physically come to church or need to be away, it's absolutely not quite the same as being together in person. So I'd really like to encourage all of you, if it is an option for you, not to just worship from your sofa, but also to meet up and join with others, to listen and to come alongside, to support and care and be part of a physical experience. I think there's a place for both going forward. And yes, church on the sofa is nice, but it's never quite the same as church in the sanctuary. The church needs you, and you need the church. The last year and a bit has been a time of waiting for updates, waiting to hear what we can and can't do, struggling with loneliness or frustration, mental health issues, physical limitations, worrying about ourselves, family, friends, community, people locally and people around the world, particularly if we've got family members who do still live at a distance. And in our waiting, suffering, struggling, peacemaking, loving and serving, we are challenged and we are changed. We are not the same people we were two years ago. Now, as we begin to emerge slowly, we go out as Christ's disciples, nourished and strengthened through our time together, reminded of our identity as disciples, loved and commissioned. And we take these steps together because that's what it means to be the body of Christ, what it means to be disciples in a challenging, difficult, confusing, and at times painful world which is also simultaneously a place of beauty and wonder. Jesus sent his disciples out, empowered them to act, commissioned them to share God's grace and justice and mercy. We are God's disciples, sharing his good news in word and in action, you are empowered, equipped, and supported by God's love and Christ's community. May you have the spiritual sensitivity and discernment to know what your next steps are. In God's name, amen.
Let's join together in prayer again. Let us pray. Holy God, before time you named us. Through time you redeem us. You call us precious in your sight. Through turbulent waters you make us steady, your hands holding strong the fragile and the weak. May we love as you love. May the fruits of our lives be food for the hungry, bread, clothing, shelter, heat, water and word. Remove the things in our lives that keep us from hearing and following your call. Take our fears, our worries, our distractions and turn them into actions of love for others. May we love as you love. Creating an eternal God whose grace is sufficient for us and whose power is made perfect in weakness. In our weakness and insufficiency, we offer our lives and the gifts of our living for the work of your kingdom. Jesus was on a mission to heal and help people. Help us be on a mission too. On a mission to be compassionate, not critical. Understanding, not difficult. Generous, not grudging. Welcoming, not rejecting. So that your kingdom may come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Gracious God, in whose love we live and move, we pray for a world crying out to feel loved and wanted, cherished and unique. We pray for a world torn apart, that lives uneasily in a climate of fear with no clear vision for future days. We pray for a world that thinks less of others than of self, a world where division between nations, race, religion, neighbour and family leads to distrust. We pray for a world that needs to know your love, your hope, your peace, your joy. A world that needs to know it is special, unique and uniquely loved by you. God of grace, in our time you have called us to be prophets, disciples, messengers, love bringers. Fill us with your spirit and support us by your gentle hands that we may persevere in speaking your word and living our faith. Enable us to trust you above all voices, beyond all of our prejudices and fears, and give us courage to follow and serve you among all of our neighbours and with one another in the body of Christ. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing again, and uh, this was one of the songs from our uh, Songs of Praise a couple of weeks ago, and when I shared that on my page, I got lots of comments telling me it was people's favourites. So I hope you enjoy singing. You'll stay seated again to sing with your mask, and again, just stay seated for the benediction at the end. I think most of you all know the drill by now. So let's sing together hymn 251, I the Lord of Sea and Sky.
Go to greet the world as here God has greeted you in worship. Go in the name of God the Creator, whose amazing strength empowers you. In the name of Christ the Redeemer, whose tremendous love transforms you. And in the name of the Holy Spirit, whose gentle presence guides you. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with each one of you and those whom you love, near and far away, now and always. Amen. <laughs>